I was very pleased to introduce Rob, who's going to talk to um, talk about Python data and web visualization. Uh, some of you might know him from uh, Vincent, uh, and um, he is currently a full stack engineer at, at Datapad. And before that, he's done work in uh, aerospace and naval architecture. So please welcome Rob. Thanks. All right. Thank you. All right, can you guys all hear me? Yeah. All right, so up and down the Python data and web visualization stack. This is kind of a terrible title, actually. I didn't know what to call this talk, so I said, all right, well, I'm going to talk about data, and I'm going to talk about like Python web viz, so that's what I'll call it. Um, hi, I'm, I'm Rob. Um, here's, the, uh, here's the link to my talk. There's my Twitter handle. I'm OceanKidBilly. I, uh, I tweeted out both, both this repo and uh, the NB Viewer version. Um, which, which mostly works. I, I'd recommend that you actually run the notebook um, live because some of the interactive JavaScript stuff um, needs to be running live. I work for Datapad. If any of you guys saw Wes's talk, uh, you, you saw kind of what we're building. Um, I'm biased because I work there, but I think it's awesome. And uh, if you're interested in being a beta tester, you can sign up at datapad.io. And, uh, and we're hiring. So if, you, uh, if you're interested in distributed systems or writing analytics code in C or data visualization, um, come talk to me. Uh, send us an email. Like, we're very interested in talking to you um, because we're, we're kind of always looking for people. So visualization in Python. We've come a long way, and a long way since I actually started writing Python, which wasn't that long ago. So it was probably about three years ago. I was, uh, I was working at a company called Vestas, it's a wind turbine manufacturer. And, uh, and Vestas is very much a MATLAB company. I mean, the, the, the company probably has 1,000 seats of MATLAB, which is quite a bit of money, if you think about it. It's being spent on MATLAB. And, uh, and I, I finally, I got fed up. Like, I, there was one day where I was trying to do something, and I was like, I, I, needed, I needed the MATLAB statistics package, which is actually something you have to pay for in MATLAB. Um, statistics don't come with the, with the standard MATLAB package. I was like, all right, I'm done. I'm going I'm to learn a new language. Um, and so I was like, all right. It came down to basically our, our CFD group was using Python. And uh, some guys in my group were using R. And I was like, well, which, which do I want to use? I think I'm going to do a lot of data viz. And honestly, I almost picked up R just because ggplot existed in R and, and didn't exist in Python, right? And, and so what did we have in Python uh, at that point, you know, three years ago? Well, in 2012, we had matplotlib. Um, and it was kind of like the dominant, the dominant data viz uh, um, library, and, and still really is. I mean, there, there's a lot of matplotlibbing that goes on. Um, there's also Chaco. Some of you might not be as familiar with Chaco. Um, Chaco did some really cool stuff with like real-time data streaming. Um, and it's a very, very neat library. Um, so fast forward two years. Where are we now? Well, we, we kind of have all of these libraries now. We have all these different ways to visualize, visualize data in, in Python. And I'm, I'm going to try to hit on every one of these, um, except for Vispy, uh, at least a little bit. Uh, there have been other talks here, um, getting really kind of deeply into some of these libraries, like there was a Boca talk yesterday. Um, there was a ggplot talk yesterday. So I'm going to kind of touch on each one and hopefully you know, expose you guys that there's a library that you've never seen before. Like, oh, I can visualize data in Python using this, um, using this library. And, and you know, it's, nice to have, it's nice to have a tool belt. So talking about the tool belt, uh, I, I've, heard, I've heard this a number of times, like in person and on Twitter, and people saying, why, doesn't, why are all these people building Python charting libraries? Like, why doesn't everybody work together and build one charting library? And to me, that same is like, why doesn't everyone work together and, work with, and write one programming language? Like, why doesn't everyone work in one programming language? Well, you know, personally, I think that especially in data viz, like choices are signs of a very healthy ecosystem. Um, I think we need more visualization libraries and that they should be opinionated. Um, and what do I mean by opinionated? Um, I'm not necessarily sure we need another D3 library that can draw line charts and bar charts, but we might need another library that can, that can aggregate and display data in kind of unique ways. And, and at the end of this talk, I'll kind of demonstrate like a D3 library that it's just drawing line charts and it's drawing scatter plots, but it's kind of doing so in a unique way and it's got unique interactions. And I think that's what we need more of. Like, I think the more data viz libraries we have, the better it is. Um, and, and that gives people choices, and, and, and choices are good. Um, so right now, kind of not just the future is web visualization, but the present is web visualization. This, this tweet's interesting. So Hadley Wickham, author of, of ggplot, um, has, has kind of formally shifted it to maintenance mode in favor of ggviz. And so what's ggviz? Well, ggviz is built on top of Vega. Uh, Vega is, uh, is basically a declarative uh, way to create D3, you know, static D3 visualizations. And then Hadley's gone full bore using, uh, using ggviz to, to render the ggplot2 kind of idioms and, and charts. So, so webviz, all right, well, we, we want to build these web visualizations. Well, how are we going to build them? 
Well, luckily, we've got this glue, and it's called IPython. And uh, it might not surprise you, but I'm gonna talk about, like, about IPython like everyone else today has talked about IPython. So what, what is IPython gluing together? Well, it's, it's gluing together Python in the browser. It's gluing together Python and JavaScript. And as we saw in the last IPython talk, it's gluing together all of these languages. And it can actually do all of this interoperatively. So the other languages that have these libraries that will render D3 and, and render charts, like we can talk to those libraries, as was demoed in the last talk. So IPython is our glue for putting all of these things together. It's you know, a really, really powerful tool. So these are kind of the new stacks, the new web visualization stacks in Python. And I, I apologize. I, I wrote some of these libraries, and I'm sorry that you know, so much of my stuff's on here. But I, I am going to try to hit on some of the other important, important libraries that are out there. So if you look at these new stacks, what I mean as a stack is like you've, you've got a Python library that's wrapping some intermediate library that's wrapping D3. And so this is kind of where web visualization inside the notebook is going right now. So we, we've got matplotlib libraries that are kind of covering up matplotlib's warts and creating a nice interface to matplotlib. They're being rendered through MPLD3, which is Jake Vanderplas's excellent, excellent package that basically takes, uh, takes matplotlib SVG output and renders that um, via D3 into the notebook. So that's great. Um, so I wrote the Vincent library. What Vincent does is it, it, uh, it works through Vega which is another wrapper library of D3. And Vega basically takes a JSON spec, and based on this declarative JSON spec, uh, you can render a chart. And, and that's really great. Um, you know, another talk I could have done here is like espousing the value of declarative data visualization and uh, visualization via, via specs, because if you build your library you know, in D3 in JavaScript, um, and, and you, let it, you let it ingest a spec, then suddenly it's, it's language independent. You can render to that library from any language. All you have to do is have a language that, that, feeds, that serves JSON. And basically, any language will do that at this point. I mean, if you want to write D3 charts in COBOL or Fortran, that's fine. It'll make JSON. You can do that. So, so those are the D3 libraries. Um, another couple libraries I'm going to talk about. Uh, well, there's Bearcart, which Rickshaw, another D3 wrapper, goes to D3. And then there's Folium, which is Leaflet. Leaflet is a mapping library. Uh, it's a very, very popular mapping library right now. It, uh, it, it serves like Google-style slippy tile maps. So, so this is kind of the new stack, the new web stack, where you have multiple layers of, of indirection, all, most of them ending at D3, but all of them ending in the browser. So now I'm going to demo, and uh, I'm going to try to show you what all these libraries do. All right, so this is my notebook. As you can see, the nice thing about the IPython notebook is it's just CSS. So you can do it. I mean, you can style it however you want. So I feel the IPython guys are like, where are my inputs? And where are, my, uh, where are the, the brackets around the code blocks? And I was like, ah, it's a presentation. I'm just going gonna, gonna to remove, remove all that I can. So I've, uh, I've gone very minimalist here. Um, this, first, this first initialization, so this is actually a problem. Um, this is something that we authors need to work on in the future. Because what's happening in these initialized notebooks is it's pulling in all of this, all of this JavaScript and all of these libraries. And these libraries are usually not clobbering each other, but I went through some real pain, like, all right, what order do I need to call these so that, um, so that basically like, things getting put on the window object are not clobbering the other things? So this is one thing that, that those of us who are, who are authoring these libraries need to work on a little bit more. Um, and it's nice because the notebook now has required JS, so like, we can manage our dependencies much, much more cleanly that way. All right, so the data I'm gonna, I'm gonna demo, there's, there's a lot of pandas in here, and if, uh, if you wanna pull down the notebook and, and run it locally, um, you can look at the pandas stuff. I'm not gonna talk too much about pandas. Uh, pandas has been talked about a lot here and, and at other, other data conferences. But just quickly, the data sets that I'm gonna look at, um, the FAA and USGS released a really cool data set. Every wind turbine in the United States is in this data set because you know, pilots need to know where they are um, so they don't, they don't hit them. Uh, and the other one is, uh, the other one is wind data that comes out of a MET mast. So I worked at a, worked at a wind turbine company, so this is the kind of stuff that I like to, to chop and analyze. And so basically, the, the first one is just uh, you know, what, turbine, manufacturer, tower height. The second one is you know, kind of streaming, streaming wind speed, wind direction data, that sort of thing. So not too much exciting going on there. So I'm going to talk about uh, Vincent really quick. And uh, so Vincent's a library I wrote that basically creates this JSON spec to render through Vega. 2D3, and uh, and this is this is largely what Vincent looks like if you're doing it the hard way. Um, Vincent is basically an ORM on, on top of uh, on top of Vega, so there's basically there's one-to-one -one mapping to all the Vega data structures, so to speak. So 
that's really what you're seeing here is I'm importing these, these kind of verbose things like access properties and property sets and, and that sort of thing. Um, and I'm, and you know, I'm, cr I'm, creating the, uh, I'm creating the chart somewhere in here. Uh, there, vincent.bar up top. And then I'm manipulating access properties and changing font sizes and fills and that sort of thing. And, and the nice thing about this is, you know, all this is, this is a big class hierarchy. So once you get everything built, if you want to change a value, you know, you can just dot notation and nest all the way into this really, really quite, quite deep JSON spec that's, uh, that's being created for Vega. And so what does that look like? Well, with a Vincent chart, you can say, all right, give me the grammar. What, what does this look like? What does my Vega spec look like? And at any point in the nesting hierarchy, you can say grammar and like, all right, what am I generating? So this is, this is all that Vincent is doing under the hood. It's just generating this, uh, this giant blob of JSON um, with, uh, with various levels of, of nested properties and, and values and that sort of thing. And then uh, it's ingesting data. One thing I don't like about Vincent right now that I'd like to change is it's not very consistent about how it takes in data uh, in terms of, of wide data versus long data. Um, it, it's, it's kind of a tough thing for charting library authors to, to figure out because, you know, Really, you'd, you'd love to just get tidy data, which basically means one row per observation in your data set. And that's, that's really the best way to, to have your data as far as, as charting it goes. But most people's data is not like that. I mean, most people, a lot of people's data, especially time series data, comes in like this. Where every, you know, there, there are a bunch of columns and you've got a number of observations for each row. And basically, if you've ever used a pandas melt, um, melting is what turns this data from wide to long. So. You know, that's, that's one thing that, that Vincent needs a little bit of work on as far as getting data in, but you know, under the hood, it's, it, it's what it's doing is it's turning this data into, into long format data, essentially. So it's, it's, uh, it's saying, you know, for, uh, you know, here's the index, here's the column, here's the value for those. So it's doing, you know, every row gets its own, gets its own value. All right, so you guys want to see data viz. This is all text. There you go. Here's what Vincent's creating. Um, you know, it's a bar chart. Nothing, nothing too exciting there. All of that, all of that property and access setting we were doing up there was basically to get, uh, to get this to display correctly because by default all these, all these labels would would clobber each other and that sort of thing. Um, so you're like, oh man, I don't know if I want to use Vincent. It's uh, it's quite verbose to get anything anything useful out of it. Well, I realized that too because all these projects that I made, like they were just scratch and itch exercises. I was like. I want to make something and I want to make it easier, so I write this library, and as I run into to hard corners, you know, I fix things. Um, so Vincent has some shortcuts that basically let, give you some, a little bit of composability of your charts, um, where you can kind of do this not very, not very Python, not very Pythonic uh, syntax, where you know, I'm wrapping things in brackets and basically doing kind of a, a dot notation to create Vincent charts. Um, and then, you know, I can create shortcuts. So I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to want this for every chart, so I'll just Run that function, run that function, and, and pass the chart in, and, and apply all those things. Um, in the future, it'd be nice to have some sort of factory, some sort of uh, color factory, where like I want every chart that comes out of this, this factory to have, to have all of these settings. So, what does that create? Oh, it's another bar chart. Great, R great, Rob. You can make bar charts. That's that's nice. Uh, what what else can you do? Well. All right, well, you know, Vincent can do stacked areas. Um, I'm just gonna quickly kind of run through some of the, the Vincent stuff um, and to get some more, some of the more exciting stuff. So, so Vincent will do stacked areas. Um, it will do group bar charts. This isn't a great group bar chart, but uh, the Vincent examples have some better ones, but you know, you can do group bar charts where you've kind of got categorical variables on the, uh, on the X axis and, and you can group by bars. Uh, you, can, you can stack as well. Um, to do line plots. If you can't do a line plot, you're not a very good charting library. Um, and then it'll do scatter plots. So great, you know, standard standard chart types. Um, the nice, kind of the nice thing about Vincent is you can output output all of this as, as the JSON object and then render it in your own website. So, you know, outside of the notebook, um, you know, you can you can build Vincent into some sort of flow where you're you're creating a JSON spec in Python and Python and then just feeding that to the front end um, and and creating like a, a, a visualization flow in that way. So the next library I'm going to talk about uh, is ggplot. And so the guys at Y Hat, um, you know, they bit the bullet for everyone, and they're like, all right, I'm, I'm done. We, we have to build a ggplot library for Python. And, uh, and they went and did it, and uh, it, it's quite good. It, it's, not, uh, it's not quite as fully featured as, as ggplot2 for R yet, but you know, give the guys some time. They're working on it. They're, uh, they're iterating. And so you know, what you see here is very, very standard um, you know, gg idioms as far as like defining aesthetics and data and then defining a set of geoms and x labels and y labels and titles and that sort of thing. So 
So this is, this is uh, I should mention, by the way, all this is being rem rendered as D3 by MPLD3 in the notebook. So every matplotlib library um, is running through MPLD3 to render these charts. So it's, uh, it's, not, it's not a PNG or anything like that. It's all being rendered, rendered in JavaScript. Um, so thanks to, thanks to Jake Vanderplas for, for that library to be able to do this. Um, so ggplot, you know, it, it will do things like histograms and that sort of thing. But the nice thing that it gives us is facetting. Um, I don't know how many of you have ever tried to write facets in matplotlib, but uh, it's it's not fun and it's extremely verbose. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of boilerplate code that goes into place to getting facets to run uh, in matplotlib, and, uh, and there's some weird little bin with thing here. But uh, with ggplot, you know, it's like oh, well, just give it a facet wrap on a variable, and there you go, facets like built in out of the box. It, it took me 30 seconds to go from data to this, and uh, and that's really powerful because you know facets are facets are, re are a really nice nice visualization tool. All right, so now we're getting into some of the dark magic of the interact widgets in the IPython notebook. So I'm going to do another ggplot uh, you know chart, and I'm going to show you how easy it is to use the interact widgets to to like real time change the data in your plot. So I've got a function. Uh, it, it's plotting. You know, it's basically charting a, a line plot that's that's got some of uh, it's got some smoothing on there. And then I just wrap this function in, in an interact, um, an interact decorator. And uh, you know, it's, it's, it's rendering column, and I give, it, uh, I give it the columns as a list, and it figures out what it needs to make as far as the widget goes. So I wrap it in the decorator, and suddenly I have this nice little drop-down menu. I'm like, oh, well, I can change this drop-down and change the data in real time. And, uh, this is really great because it means that rather than having, you know, 50 charts in my notebook for my demo, I just wrap it with a little interact widget, and suddenly I have interactive charts, and I'm able to reload different dimensions of the data. And I, I had to do nothing other than create a function and, and, and add a decorator, um, and that's really powerful, like very, very powerful. So, so that's ggplot. Uh, I'm going to quickly talk about Boca. There is way more than I can talk about with this library, like in, in this talk. I just don't have the time to talk about all the things that Bokeh can do. It's very, very powerful. Um, I, I'm really happy that they're working on it, and because they, they've built in some some really great interactivity, um, which is which is tremendous. Um, and, and part of what makes Bokeh great is so they've got this little toolbar, and you can define, you know, you can you can add and, and remove tools from this toolbar kind of at will. So. What you see happening here is like, all right, well, I'm going to create a hover tool tip. So, you know, in this tools, if it's if it's an object, I create this hover tool, and then it's kind of got this little templating language at x and x and at, at x y. Uh, and so, what it's going to do is, if I hover over, if I turn on the hover tool, render over point, it's like, all right, this is x, this is y, and suddenly I have interactive tooltips. And all I had to do was was define a little template for it, and. Uh, and it, it, it was very little work. So, and then they've got some really nice, you know, they've got panning and they've got wheel zoom. So I can go in and out. I can reset the view. They've got box zoom. Um, so there's just some great interactivity with, with Boca plots. And uh, it's a library I'd, re I'd recommend looking at. I'd recommend looking at their examples. There are a lot of them. They've spent a lot of work uh, creating some, some really nice notebooks and some really, some really nice visualizations. So, so that's Boca, uh, and, and go check out that project. It's really cool. Um, all right, so next library. This is, uh, this is Bear Cart. This is another one that I wrote. Uh, and so this is a wrapper on um, Rickshaw, which is a library that was written by Shutterstock. Uh, focuses on time series uh, visualization. And uh, as far as that goes, like, I, it, when I was talking about opinionated libraries, this is a good one because it's very opinionated in what it does. It's like we do time series visualization. It's all we do, but we try to do it as well as we can. And they've got some really nice features and some features that are really nice to have in the notebook. So like, what are some of these features? Well, if I just want to view certain data points, I can just turn off data via the legend. So, oh, that's really nice. Um, you know, if I, if I want to drill down into, into, single, into single dimensions. Um, and, and, the, and to do that, all I did was pass in a data frame, specify a color palette, height, width, tell it what kind of plot type I wanted, and that was it. Um, it's, it's, there are a couple of different plot types you can do. There's bars, um, there's areas. Again, you know, turning, turning on and off data is as simple as that. So you're probably wondering, all right, well, what is that slider, slider on the bottom? Well, uh, bear card also lets you zoom in. So this is actually a bar chart um, that looks like an area chart when you zoom far enough, off, far enough out. 
Um, and, and you can do, do real-time zooming. So there, zoom in on data, turn off this data, and there you go. So this is really nice for, let it, for drilling down into your data sets, you know, plotting, plotting a, really big, a really big series of data and then drilling down to a, a certain time range. Um, and I think they handle tooltips pretty nicely. Um, their their tooltips are pretty good. So you've got a tooltip over the data point, and you've also kind of got this floating, floating tooltip up top. So that's bear cart, uh, rickshaw charts, time series charts. If you got time series and you want to do some interactivity, that's it's it's a, it's a pretty good library. Um, all right, Seaborn. So Seaborn is written by uh, Michael Wascom. He's a PhD candidate at Stanford, and uh, I, I wish I'd had this library two years ago. It's an unbelievable library. So kind of like ggplot, it focuses on statistical data viz uh, and and approaching that in kind of unique ways. So this is what uh, Seaborn calls an LM plot. So Seaborn also handles faceting very, very nicely. Facets are, are generated, you know, I just, I say call equals turbine manufacturer, boom, suddenly I have facets for turbine manufacturer. Very, very, very nice. Um, and it's got the statistical visualization stuff built in. Um, again, interact widgets. I love this, this type of chart. So this is nice, X versus Y, but it also gives you the distributions for each axis. Um, really, really nice chart. So I'm like, all right, well, I wanna look at 50 meter wind speed. Um, let's look at wind direction. Oop. Wait a second. There it goes. All right. So there you go. Interact widget. Now we're looking at different dimensions. We can see that whoever put up this met mast did a bad job because what you want to do when you're measuring wind is not put the mast in front of the dominant wind direction. So clearly the mast is here. The wind is coming from this direction, and it's blocking you know where you're getting most of your wind from. So bad job by them. But uh, you know now we can see that because it's easy to. Uh, it's easy to change dimensions with the widgets. And again, I didn't really have to do anything. I just had to create a, a, a function and wrap it with the interact decorator. Um, in the same vein, you know, it'll also handle density. So, you know, you see in the upper right, so you can barely see it. Um, you know, the, the params there pass in the kind like kernel density and create a density plot. I think you can also add distributions to these to these top and uh, these left and right charts, um, which is really nice. And so, you know, it's got histogram charts and you can also plot a histogram. So I'm like, all right, well, you know, I want to plot wind speed one, 50 meter wind mean, but I kind of want to look at these different distributions. So I'm gonna go to my tool belt, use the interact thing again. Well, what does this look like if it's Weibull distributed? Calculating, there you go, Weibull distribution on the fly. Um, like, all right, well, what about normal distribution? So there you go. Um, and then behind the scenes, you know, SciPy is calculating things, and then the interact widget is handling the re-rendering for us. So again, interactivity um, with the widgets, very easy. Don't be afraid of the widgets. They're very, very easy to use. Didn't take me that long at all to get them, to get them wired up. Um, all right, so last library before I talk about uh, kind of a new library. This is a library I wrote called Folium, and what Folium does is it brings uh, leaflet maps into the notebook, and, and you can also just generate you know, the HTML itself if you want. But uh, Folium lets you, you know, it, it ingests GeoJSON and pandas and, and fill colors and le legend names, and I'm like, all right, well, I want to see you know, the uh, turbine count per state. So I'm like, all right, well, California and Texas are doing really well. Some of the Midwest is doing well as far as building out wind power. Um, so this is, all, this is all being rendered with leaflet. Um, the, the legend, that's just being quantile binned in pandas, and that's being rendered with D3. But, you know, this is a fully interactive chart. Um, it's like any other slippy map where you can zoom in. Um, Leaflet also lets you, uh, you know, plot points. So this is, this is Solano. Solano is a, a wind turbine site. It's actually just north of here. If you're flying out of the Bay Area, you can see it if you know what you're looking for. It's, uh, it's just northeast of Suisun Bay. But uh, basically, with Folium, you know, you can say I want polygon markers uh, for for each of these each of these rows in the data frame, and then you can specify um, you can specify what you want to be in each of those markers. In this case, I'm right. I'm like, all right. Well, I want to know uh, I want to know what my ID is, so I can just specify. You know, all right, for each of these markers, write out write out the ID. And uh, there's also a little there's a little option here called. Uh, lat long popover, and that's basically what you just saw. You can just enable it, and you click anywhere on the map, and it'll enable lat long, plot, lat long pot, uh, popovers there. So the last one kind of pulls together both Folium and Vincent. So these are three wind measurement stations uh, near Mount Hood. I live in Portland, so you know, I'm, I'm in and around Mount Hood a lot. So uh, one thing I did with Folium, I was like, I, I see it being you know, a use case where people want to plot points, and they also want to know about data associated with those points. So 
You can interact. Um, you can basically stick a Vincent chart in a Folium popover, and you can add charts to your popovers. So um, basically, you can put points on a map, and then you can uh, you can put charts on those points. And so you know you can't really tell because the data is very similar, but each of these points has a different chart. And uh, and you know Vincent's doing Vincent's basically doing the rendering, like the chart creation for the the chart itself, and then Folium's handling handling the map. So let's quickly go back to this guy. So that, that was the demo. So I, you know, I'm sorry I had to run through that a little bit, but give you a very, very brief overview of like most of the, the Python data viz libraries um, and where we are right now. So the future. Um, what is the future? Well, so IPython has, you know, has all these hooks in the Julian R. Julian R has some really great plotting libraries. Um, there's no reason that we, we couldn't be rendering in the notebook via, via Julia's Gadfly library or via R's R charts library. And uh, Ramnath, I'm also not going to try to pronounce his last name, the, the author of the R charts library has done an incredible job building that library. He's basically built connectors for almost every D3 charting library that exists. Um, so if we can get that working in the notebook, like suddenly we have all these options for charting. Um, so what else does the future look like? Well, the IPython guys are doing some work. So we've got these comms, we've got this communication layer. Uh, we've got these widgets, all right? So, so now we've got a commu communication layer between Python and JavaScript. Um, well, what if we use some of these comms and these widgets to, uh, to make visualization? Because we've got this nice pipeline, right? We've got Python that's talking to Backbone. Well, why don't we make Python talk to Backbone, talk to D3? Saying, all right, let's write a new library. It's called Sticky. Um, I would not recommend using this library for anything yet, but... Uh, <laughs> There, there are, it, it, it's to say don't put this library into production, but I do want you to tinker with it. So um, it looks very much like my other libraries, uh, you know, initialize the notebook. Um, I, I, I pulled in Chris Vial's um, micropolar library here. So I, you, at, at some point you're saying, all right, well, Rob, this looks a lot like your other stuff, like you're just rendering a blob of JavaScript into the notebook. That's great. Well, what's going on behind the scenes here? So let's, let's look at some code. Um, so if we go into let's let's start with the uh, let's start with the widget itself. So this is what a widget looks like in IPython notebook, and basically all that this widget exists to do is to render a DOM element for us. So this widget's rendering a DOM element. Um, the core part of the package, what it's doing here is it's saying, all right, uh, you know, I'm going to give give myself a chart ID. Um, I'm going to initialize the widget JS, which is basically just pulling in dependencies. I'm going to get my DOM widget. Um, I'm going to say, when it's displayed, render the chart, don't display it beforehand, I'm going to say display my DOM widget, so the DOM widget displays, creates this little DOM element. On the callback, it'll render the chart, and it'll display the chart. All right, well, what are we doing to render the chart? So I won't show you the micropolar one, I'll show you the D3 plus one that I built. So this is what a widget looks like as far as like implementing. So when I say display self, it's basically figuring out, all right, I, I've, I've basically built all these attributes on this class. In this class, these are all, uh, you know, what do they call them, traitlets. These are all communicate, these are all traitlets, IPython uh, widget traitlets. So each traitlet has a type. So in this case, there are a bunch of Unicode types. Um, there's a list type uh, for data. I'm basically serializing the JSON. Um, the rest of the library, there's, there's not much exciting going on in there. You know, I'm just saying you can define a line chart, a stacked area, a group scatter, that sort of thing. Um, but for the, so let's run this guy. All right, so, so there we go. So we defined, we defined a, a, a D3 plus chart. Um, basically it created a DOM element, came back and said D3 plus widget render, and it plotted it. So now we have a new library you know, that, we can, that we can render in the notebook. Um, so great, that's, that's good. Um, and, and I should mention that this is actually rendering in the widget area. This isn't taking a blob of, of JavaScript and HTML and, and evaling it into, into here. It's actually rendering in the widget area live. So you might be thinking, all right, well, now that we've got this rendering in the widget area and we've got, you know, we've got these layers talking to one another, let me go a little deeper. How can we go deeper? All right, now we get, all right so what else can we do with this? All right, well, it's like, okay, well, we're rendering this widget. We're rendering a chart as a widget. What if we create a widget, a widget that renders the chart as a widget? It's like, okay, well, we've got we've got multiple nesting layers here, but all right. So we've got a chart here. We've got a uh, we've got a widget at the bottom here that lets us change the data. And here's where kind of like the brilliant part comes in. Here's where the beauty of the comm system comes in, is that we're not we don't have to re-render the chart. Um, you know, when we update the data, we can pass the new data to the backbone model, and it can use D3's updating machinery. To, uh, to nicely transition that data. So change the data to, 
and you've got nice transitions. You're no longer re-rendering. Um, and, and this is really, really powerful. Like this is kind of just touching the surface of, of what you can do um, with that sort of thing. Let me show you another one real quick. This is a uh, this is like a, a scatter plot. This is a kind of a cool scatter plot because you can basically you know zoom to multiple levels of scatter. So um, this is an opinionated library. This is a neat feature you don't see in many D3 libraries. So you've got group one. Within that group, you've got scatter plot. You've got points. When you zoom in on this, you get more points. So um, I'm going to update the data. Let's see. And there we go. Transitions. Um, and I, you know. I'm not re-rendering the chart. Um, the data is being, you know, uh, transition live. So think about like the, the possibilities for for what this gives us. Um, you know, we've got Python, we've got D3, and they're talking to each other, and the data can live update. So think about, all right, well, what if we wanted to brush brush a chart, and that brush could send back some filtering constraints to Python. Python could filter a data set that's you know, five million rows long and then dynamically update all the charts you know, for that data set. And it's not re-rendering anything, it's just communicating back and forth uh, via the communication protocol there. Um, it's really powerful. Like suddenly, suddenly we're, we're kind of reaching this, this level of interactivity in a notebook um, that, 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 that's really compelling. Um, so I'm really excited about it. I'm gonna keep working on this library and, and, and you know, work with the IPython guys to, to get this built in. But uh, you know, kind of in conclusion, um, Thank you all. I think we're in a really good place for data viz. It's really exciting because there's a lot of things that, are, that we can work with to build visualizations, and there's more that we can do in the future to, uh, to build libraries with, with interactive visualization in the notebook. And uh, you know, it's a good time to be, be visualizing data in Python. So thanks. <laughs>Uh, yeah, it's clear that D3 is very powerful, but um, it seems to me that it's also a little bit slow when it comes to bigger sets of data and interactive visualizations. So are there, do you think D3 is, is the clear path, or do you think there may be other alternatives? I, honestly, like, I, D3 will work. I, I think D3 and like SVG rendering of data sets will, will be around for a long time. I think the future probably probably is going to be doing some WebGL stuff. That's what's interesting about VSP is it's working with WebGL to, to render with WebGL. The problem is, I mean, Jason Sunder was talking about this earlier, you run out of pixels, right? So at some point, you really do want to be doing data aggregation for your visualizations. There's only so many pixels on the screen, and if you're rendering data points one pixel at a time, like it's not a very good visualization anyway. So it really comes down to the need to aggregate your data um, and display something that's, that's useful to the user. So. Um, you know, the, the browser, we're kind of always going to have those limitations for how fast JavaScript is and how fast the browser is working with data. But, and as far as like rendering SVG elements, but my argument would be you shouldn't be rendering that many SVG elements in the first place. Like, you, you should not be overloading the DOM. You should be careful about, about aggregation. So, thanks for a really great presentation. Oh, sorry. Yeah. He gave me the microphone. So, um, so thanks for a great presentation. It was really nice Thanks. to see kind of all these things loaded in the IPython notebook. Um, actually, to that point about SVG versus non-SVG things, there is the intermediate thing, which is Canvas, right? Yeah. Which I think SVG really caps out at a few thousand elements. Yeah. Um, and many people have more than just a few thousand elements. But they don't need to put all billion in the notebook. Yeah. And so, um, so I just want to point out that like Bokeh, for instance, does render to Canvas. So I think yeah. one of, the, one of the, the only toolkits, I think, yeah, Talk Vincent, about Vincent renders to Canvas too. Oh, it does okay. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah. So, it does, but but it's it, because Vega renders to Canvas, right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, they make it easy. So. And Bokeh oh, wow. also can consume Vega. So there's sort of a graph yeah. of things yeah, here. But exactly. um, but the idea here, I think, is that um, one of the one of the things I am kind of curious about is in terms of the data binding on the backbone side, um, we I think just overall. We've had some discussions with the IPython guys as well about how do we get in a common because you're right that Python to um, something kind of reactive model to JavaScript is a bridge that everyone needs to cross. Mm -hmm. Whether we're sending JSON across to render SVG or whether we're sending JSON across to update, um, you know, Canvas elements essentially in our in our case with Bokeh. Uh, and I think that'd be you know it's really great to see the new project. And but I think we should work together on some of these yeah, things because we yeah. all have the same needs there. Yeah, for sure, absolutely, absolutely. I think yeah, we had a question right here. It's been I was curious if you would recommend any of these or which one you would recommend for uh, dynamic updates and live streaming data. 
That's a, that's a good question. I, I'd almost say none of these. Like, a lot of these are, are kind of. That was are, my sense, yeah, my guess. But. Not, not really any of them. Like, you know, one of Vincent's limitations is this kind of a, a static render. Um, I, I feel like Bokeh might actually be the answer to that question, probably. Um, because they're really working a lot. I, I know that like in the history with, with Chaco and that sort of thing, like there's been a lot of, of thought put into how to handle dynamically updating data. So probably none of these except maybe Bokeh will be able to handle in the future. And I'd probably talk to Peter about that. There you go. There you go. Perfect. I have a two-part question. Uh, what you said about um, libraries being opinionated, I think was really interesting. So the, the first part of the question is, can you unpack that word a little bit more? Do you just mean specific, you know, being good at specific formats, or do you mean more than that? Uh, and the second part of the question is, uh, what in your opinion is missing right now? What, what other opinionated libraries do we need that we don't have yet? Yeah. It's fair. Um, yeah, as far as opinionated go, I mean both opinionated and design. So really, um, you know, getting away from uh, MATLAB style charts and really, you know, applying some nice design to your charts, something that, something that a designer would build, basically. Um, so opinionated design and opinionated and maybe not trying to, to boil the ocean with, all, with your charting library and saying, I want to do, I want to do five things really well. I want to be the best charting library for doing you know, these five things, and I want it to be, I want to make beautiful charts so that people are happy to, to use them in their presentations and use them on their website. Um, sorry, what was your second question? Is about uh, what's missing? Um, I really think that I really think like the uh, the dynamically linked brushing is is the big one right now. Being able to uh, being able to use that communication layer and do do dynamic filtering. Uh, of data uh, back and forth between Python and, and, and visualization. And, and we'll get there. It's just like somebody needs to build it, basically. So, yep. so uh, going back to your comment on MATLAB, I replaced a MATLAB program recently for real-time instrument I.O. Um, and there's not a lot of good options on the desktop. I'm having to use PyQWT, which is absolutely hideous. Is there any chance that any of this stuff can be worked back into a desktop framework? Probably not. I mean, a lot of this depends pretty heavily on being in the browser, right? So, I mean, almost, almost everything, basically everything here lives in the browser. The whole, the whole demo was, was built in the browser. So, I mean, not off the top of my head, not that I know of, um, but that's something I'm not as familiar with either, so hard to say. So I'll ask you practical questions. If I have all the code in MATLAB that generates something that currently looks pitch black because there are so many plots one on top of the other, just so much data. Mm -hmm. how, how much time will it take for me to actually, if I have, it's, it's automatically generated code. How much, how easy or hard it will be for me to transform to one of your nicer plots that allow you to do all those nice interactive things? Um, depending on the library you're going to use, uh, like Seaborn handles um, binning pretty well, so it'll handle like hex binning and square binning very nicely for that sort of thing, where you just have this blob of points and you need to actually bin them into like discrete bins. Um, I, I, it's hard to say without looking at your matplotlib code, but normally if you have a bunch of matplotlib code and you kind of have a data schema, you can get it into Seaborn pretty easily. Um, as far as turning the matplotlib code, I mean, eventually you need to you need to bin it somehow, right? Because right now you've got this huge this huge pile of points. I'm not as familiar with how matplotlib will handle that sort of binning. I know it does. Um, I know that Seaborn handle, handles it easily. Uh, that's what I'd recommend: is like start with a wrapper library that uh, that kind of offers nice syntax for doing this sort of thing. And then uh, if you have to go down to like you know low low level matplotlib, um, start looking at at sort of things like heat maps and and, and binning of, of data points and, and that sort of thing. So. Well, thanks, everybody. Appreciate it.